Hello, can you all hear me? Okay. Um, I'm Charlie. I'm here to talk to you all today about uh, how we got started with DevOps principles and practices at Northwoods. Uh, this is me. I've been a DevOps lead for about three years at Northwoods. I've been working on building infrastructure and working with the application team that's building an application called Traverse. And uh, I've been an advocate for DevOps principles and practices. And uh, along with a lot of other smart and talented people on the application team, um, we've made a lot of progress over the last three years, and I wanted to uh, take this opportunity to share that. So Northwoods is a small software company based in Dublin. Uh, we build software for social services workers, so caseworkers and social workers. Um, these folks are out there uh, working for government agencies and economic assistance and child support and uh, children's services. And these folks are working with some of the most vulnerable populations in our society, um, neglected and abused children and um, economic assistance like food stamps and Medicaid and emergency cash assistance. And it's honestly been a real privilege to, to build software that helps these people in their jobs to be more efficient and, and uh, take better care to serve the clients that they're working with. Um, it, in previous DevOps days, this is the fourth one I've attended, we've heard stories from larger corporations, uh, billion dollar companies, um, some based in here, here in Columbus and others elsewhere. And we heard another story, an awesome story this morning. Um, I wanted to give the perspective of a small software company. So the story I'm gonna tell you is about uh, an ops team of three and a development team of approximately 10, um, building an, and delivering an application to our end users. So uh, to set the stage for you, when we started uh, implementing DevOps practices at Northwoods three years ago in 2016, uh, the, the landscape at Northwoods was building thick client applications that uh, we installed on customer servers on premises in their networks. So customers would buy the software, we would send out a project team and solution architects, they would install that software, and uh, after the project was over, um, the project team would move on, and the care and feeding of that software was left to the customer. Um, so this you know, kind of created some issues. There, the customer adoption of new versions was very slow. Customers were very conservative. Um, six to 12 months was, was an average. Um, a customer who upgraded every six months was considered fairly a, a rapid adopter of new versions. Um, and um, there was, there was a big gap between the development team and uh, the software running in production, delivering value to the end users. So our software teams released the software once a month, but the software then went and lived in a folder on SharePoint. And it wasn't until our upgrade team kind of pestered the customer enough to say, hey, can we get you upgraded so we don't have to keep supporting these old versions of the software um, that you know the customer would kind of relent and allow us to do an upgrade. So it was a really different situation. Um, if, if incidents happened with the software in production, um, there was this kind of circuitous path to get back to the application team. So the customer would tell their IT staff, their IT staff would reach out to our support center, our support center would work with the scrum master, and maybe the application team would get involved a day or two later after logs had been gathered and all this stuff. And then <clears throat> if they needed to establish a VPN connection, to investigate the problem on the customer's network, that was another couple of days to get that organized. So um, the, there was really no connection between the software that was running in production and the folks who were building it. So uh, on-premises software is really tough in that regard, and there's actually a talk this afternoon on um, embracing DevOps with on-premises software, so I encourage you to attend that talk if you're curious about how uh, DevOps uh, thinking can apply to these kind of situations. Um, this talk, however, is not about that software. Um, three years ago, uh, Northwood's leadership decided to build a brand new application. Um, it was going to be web-based, it was gonna be hosted in the cloud, and uh, we were gonna sell it as a SaaS model as opposed to the COTS software we'd, we'd been selling in the past. So this presented a new opportunity for me. I was a product owner at the time, and I was kind of wanting to get back to my technical roots. And um, so I took the opportunity to become a DevOps lead and work with the application team that was building this software. Um, 
this was a, a really kind of a cool opportunity that doesn't really come along that often. Um, it was a greenfield app built from scratch. Because Northwoods had previously um, installed the software on the customer servers, we had never hosted customer software, so we didn't have an operations team. So there were no silos to break down. There were no other teams to, um, you know, to, or, or bad habits to unlearn, that kind of thing. So we could kind of start fresh. And then the final uh, piece that really made this a unique opportunity was we had management support right from the beginning. So uh, management understood the concept of DevOps and the value it brought, and were kind of on board with letting us, the application team, myself, my two ops uh, team coworkers, to, to build and design the best processes that would let us basically do what really matters in this business, which is delivering valuable software to our end users. Um, so where are we now? It's 2019, we've been, we've been at it for three years. The application's in production, we're serving thousands of users across five states. Um, we are able to ship software about twice a week and we can deliver it during business hours while the users are using the application. Um, we make uh, errors visible in real time to the application team, so there's a strong connection between you know, how, how is the application actually doing out there? Are people using it? Are they having problems? Are things going well? This is really visible to the team. Um, and finally, we learn from our mistakes. So when we have incidents um, in production, when we have a deploy that fails to go out, um, we post-mortem those and the ops and the application team Members get together, discuss the problem, and uh, you know, figure out how we can get better. So um, you know, a story that kind of illustrates what I feel has been our progress over the past three years is that um, last Friday afternoon, kind of late in the day, uh, a new release was ready, and a developer said, let's go ahead and deploy this to production. And there was not a single voiced concern from anyone saying, whoa, this is right before the weekend, hold off. Um, Everyone was confident in the software, confident in the tests, confident in our release process, our deploy scripts and the infrastructure, and it was really awesome to see um, just the, the team go out and, and deploy on a Friday. So what is DevOps, right? Um, three years ago, when I started uh, working in this role and helping build this application, there was a, a ton of information around. Uh, DevOps had been going strong for about six years, I guess, at that point. Um, and there were some things about DevOps that were kind of easier to latch on to, kind of technical practices like automation, infrastructure as code, um, continuous delivery pipelines, cloud, all, all that stuff kind of made sense. And it was, it was kind of easy to latch on to. And I could sit down with people, I could talk to them about it, we could build cards in a backlog to, to do work to implement those kind of things. What I felt was really hard and what I really struggled with was the culture side of things. So, when you hear people talk about DevOps, they'll often say that DevOps is not a tool and it's, it's a mindset. It's not a job title, it's a culture. So that's kind of a hard thing to sit down with someone and say, okay, we're gonna be a DevOps culture. What, is that, what does that really mean, right? What, how is our behavior gonna change? What kind of things are we gonna do? And so uh, I'm hoping to share with you over the next few minutes some, you know, some concrete examples of, of how we evolved over the years to, to try to implement a DevOps culture. I'm, I'm gonna try to avoid talking about tools. Um, so, let's see. The, the three ways were kind of popularized by Gene Kim and his collaborators in the Phoenix uh, project and the DevOps handbook. And when I'm thinking about uh, implementing DevOps at Northwoods and trying to get better at delivering software, um, this is kind of how I try to think about it. And um, so it's up on the slide there. The first way is uh, the fast and safe flow of working software to end users. So we wanna get it out there in their hands. If it's uh, built software sitting on the shelf, it's not providing value, it's inventory, that's waste in, in the lean terminology. Um, so, but we also wanna be safe about delivering this software, right? We wanna be able to deliver it rapidly without introducing problems. The second way is to get information from the software that's out in production back through the operations team, back to the application team, and beyond. So by beyond, what I mean is to product owners, product managers, um, other departments within the company, maybe a customer success team or the, the support center, or even executives, because this information is really valuable to help you learn and improve your processes as you're delivering. Um, and then finally, the third way is all about experimenting and learning. 
So uh, in terms of, I guess I'm going to structure the talk around those three ways. So in terms of flow, the very first thing that comes to mind is if we're going to flow and we're going to be fast at delivering uh, software to the end user, how does that actually happen, right? And so it's kind of natural to talk about deploys. So at Northwoods, the state we're at right now is that the application uh, team is, is in charge of delivering the software to the end user. They, they hit the button that, that puts the software into production. This was not always the case. So as you're going to hear many times throughout this talk, um, we started with the smallest thing that could possibly work and iterated on it over time. So at the beginning, the operations team was responsible for deploying the application. We had a script we would run, and we would deploy the app. Um, we quickly realized that the QA team, uh, it was inefficient for them to keep asking the ops team to deploy a version of software into their instances. So uh, we enhanced the script and we put it into a CI tool. So there was a web interface where the QA team could go in, they could pick the version of the software they wanted and they could click the environment from a drop down and hit a button and the software would go into the environment for them so they could self-service. Um, and we leveraged that process also to start releasing into production. So we had a web page you could go to, you could pick your version, your customer, and environment, and we could push the software out to production. So uh, the operations team started doing that as well. So uh, we were not able to deliver the software during business hours early on, so at 9 p.m. we would get on a conference call, we would deliver the software, and uh, the ops team and the app team paired on that work. So at 9 p.m. on a deploy night, a member from the ops team, a member from the applications team would get together at 9 p.m. and do the deploy, right? And so as we got better over time, you know, then uh, the ops team sort of stepped back a little bit, and so we were just kind of on standby. So on a deploy night, the application team member doing the deploy would, would connect to the server and do the deploy, and the ops person was just kind of watching Slack to see if anything came up but wasn't really participating on the, the meeting. Um, so as you can imagine, as we went through this process, right, um, we started getting better at delivering our software, and we had more releases to deliver to the user. And so if you're doing a deploy at 9 p.m. you know, once a month, that's probably not so bad, especially if it rotates. But if you start doing that uh, once a week or multiple times a week, that starts to get old real fast. So because the application team was involved in the deploys and they were feeling the pain of having to get on the, their laptop at 9 o'clock at home and do the deploy, this sparked a lot of conversations, right? Like, what can we do to, do, to make this better? What, can, what places in the application are preventing us from deploying during the day? And so there was two main areas of the application, there was a scanning page and a form filling page that kind of maintained a lot of client side state and if the page refreshed the users would lose the data. So uh, the app team took on uh, enhancing those pages to uh, you know, kind of store that data on the website as the user left the field or, or as each page came in so we didn't have to you know, worry about any kind of data loss during an upgrade scenario. And then the ops team worked on implementing a blue-green deploy pattern. And you know, after several months of work by both teams, we ended up in a state where we were able to, de to deploy the application during the day. So then, hey, you know, this is great. You know, we can deploy you know, two times a week. We can do it at lunchtime, or we can do it in the morning. Uh, if we have a bug fix of available, we can just put it out right away. We don't have to wait till the evening. So, um, the next kind of thing I'd like to talk about is collaboration. And this, this to me, is kind of the heart of DevOps. If if you kind of look at the word like I develop and an ops mush together, what does that mean? Um, a lot of people are sh trying different methods. You know, to do the uh, ops people learn how to code? Do the developers learn infrastructure? Do we collapse the team together? What does that actually mean? Um, so at, at Northwoods, what we did was we just started with two ops people building infrastructure, and then the application team was building the application. Um, but because we didn't have any silos to start with, like I mentioned, this, this the advantages we had with the Greenfield application, um, we chose to not to build any silos. So the app team and uh, my coworker and I were, were co-located together in the same workspace. Um, my coworker and I attended all the, the application team sprint activities. So we went to their stand-ups, we went to their sprint um, plannings and their retrospectives. and. Um, we, we ended up with this culture of, of joint responsibility for the application. And I, I really think 
what led to that was um, sharing the work and sharing the knowledge. So because we were working closely together on the application, we were in the same meetings, hearing the same things. Um, as I mentioned, we had many nine o'clock deploy sessions together. Um, th there was a great amount of trust that built up between the teams. And we ended up with this place where everyone really cared deeply about the application, about making it better. There was no us versus them because we didn't let it start that way. Um, we were kind of unified in our goal of figuring out how best to deliver this application. So when the application team needed to build stuff to make that better, they did. When the ops team needed to fix stuff, we did. And um, we, we've had a lot of success by making the two teams kind of very highly integrated. Um, the ops team of, of now three people is dedicated to that, that Traverse team. They're, we're not serving multiple applications. So it's allowed us to be very focused and um, to be excellent uh, collaborative partners. Um, the next thing I'd like to talk about is, is planning. So if you think about the flow of, of software out to the end user, you often think about this workflow that kind of starts with plan and design and then you know, maybe build and test and deploy and, and monitor and operate. So <clears throat> I really didn't want the operations team to be in a, in a place where they're just passively receiving new versions that came from the application team. Um, if you have an application that a new feature gets developed with some kind of an architectural flaw and it gets out into production, that's really expensive to remediate. So um, it's really awesome if the ops team can be partners with the app team at the design phase. So because we were embedded in their meetings, you know, our ears would perk up when we heard during sprint planning, we're going to add this new feature that's going to ingest a ton of data, or the mobile app is going to start syncing back photos that are captured in the field. Okay, now alarm bells are going off in my head, you know, what do we need, what kind of capacity do we need on the server side to resize those images, to store them and properly handle things. So. Um, this kind of close, closely working together, but not just you know, at deploy time, right? So the planning is kind of at the opposite end of the spectrum. I really wanted to be a, a resource and a partner for the application team. So you know, when we're designing a new feature, maybe we could suggest an AWS service that might fit in, or um, you know, those kind of things that will help the application be easier to operate once it actually gets out into production. So the second way is about feedback loops. So I'm going to skip past that cheesy slide and then we'll talk about operational insight. So I, I kind of told the story at the very beginning when I talked about the progress we've made about um, getting feedback from the application back upstream, right? So when we started with Traverse, we wanted to know when exceptions happened. So we did what most teams do. We bought an exception handling tool and we integrated it into the application. So now there's exceptions in JavaScript on the front end or in the Rails back end. They go to a website. We can log in, see what exceptions are happening, how many are, are happening of each type, and who's being affected, and so forth. And um, over time, there was, you know, as, as is kind of natural in teams, there was a big focus on feature work and, you know, kind of, you know, making sure that we kept, you know, operational uh, attributes of the app in mind kind of slipped from focus for a time, and there was a, a large amount of errors happening. And this was kind of visible to the op team, ops team and kind of frustrating for us because we saw you know, exceptions happening all the time. It's, it's hard to support and operate an, a, an, op, an application when you see lots of errors. Is that normal? Is that bad? You know, What's actually going on out there? It's hard to know. So um, this error reporting software was hooked up to a Slack channel, um, but it really wasn't kind of registering on people's radars. So something we, and the software had an interesting feature that would uh, put a message in the Slack channel the first time an error happened, the 10th time, 100th time, 1,000th time, which is really good if you don't want to get a lot of notifications, but it can, it can have the side effect of hiding errors. So for example, if the 100th error just happened, you won't see another notification for 900 more errors. And it, it's also kind of viscerally different in the channel to see, oh, 100 errors of this type occurred, one message than to see 100 errors come into the channel. So we actually went in and we turned that feature off and said just send every, <laughs> every exception to the channel. And then we separated non, uh, prod and non-prod into different channels. It was the most amazing thing that happened because conversations changed that afternoon. 
like it was immediately clear the volume of errors that were happening. There was no, no, no longer any doubt that they might be being generated by QA, QA activities. And immediately developers were talking about what can we do to reduce this number of exceptions that we're seeing? Is this affecting user behavior? You know, maybe we should get out there and like sit with some users and see if this flood of things we're seeing is actually, you know, kind of hurting the way they use the application. You, you know, and, and out of that came a process where there was a 10% amount of cards in the sprint allocated toward triaging and fixing the most uh, common occurring exceptions. And we kept that process until we reduced the number of exceptions down to a normal level. So um, to, to me, that's a great story about what happens when you take, you know, things that are happening with your application in production, with your infrastructure, and expose that feedback back upstream. So on call. Um, Right now, our application team is the first on call when incidents happen. Of course, things did not start this way. Um, early on, it was the ops team who got paged when things went south. And the ops team would go and try to fix it. Of course, you know, the ops team doesn't understand the application as well as a developer. And so um, we quickly sometimes needed to pull in developers when an incident happened. Um, and as I mentioned, you know, we've been building this culture of, of shared ownership and um, responsibility for this application, working very closely together. And uh, it was very common for an application developer and an ops person to pair together on remediating incidents. And then over time, we realized, you know what, we really just need to make the application uh, team uh, first on call for the application. It, it maps directly back. I can't think of a stronger feedback signal of what's actually happening out in production than getting a page, right? So if you're the app team, that's great feedback about what you're building. So, um, but the, the ops team did not vanish off into the sunset, right, when we handed over the pager. Uh, the ops team stayed as the second level escalation. So if the, an application uh, developer uh, can't get to the page, uh, it'll escalate to ops, or if they are investigating an issue and if they want help, they just hit a button to escalate, and then we're right back in there pairing with them, uh, resolving the issue. So, yeah. Okay, so uh, the third way is about learning, experimentation, and uh, improvement. So I've kind of hit on this several times throughout this, but I, uh, a huge key to our success was tight integration between operations and uh, developers. That's the heart of DevOps, mutual, mutual respect, joint responsibility. Um, in addition to the regular sprint activities that we participate in, the app team and the ops team each has a series of roundups that occur every two weeks. And these are meetings where each team is trying to improve their craft. Maybe a developer uh, implemented a new pattern in a Rails controller and they want to show other developers that, that pattern can spread through the rest of the code base. Uh, in an ops roundup, maybe we, I want to share the latest thing I learned about Ansible or um, you know, you know, we want to talk about how we can reduce some technical debt in our our code base, what our plan of attack is. And both teams are cross-invited to these meetings, so um, there's a huge amount of sharing that goes on. And because the ops team is part of the product delivery organization at Northwoods, um, the operations team is uh, invited to the every six monthly roadmap updates to learn what's coming down the pipe or what the teams are gonna be building. In our case, the Traverse team that we support. And um, the, the ops team has a quarterly infrastructure sharing meeting where we kind of show the architecture diagram and what we've built in the last three months and we kind of solicit feedback from developers about, um, you know, if they have suggestions or ideas, questions. And we also share things like results of the latest uh, DR tests and, um, you know, maybe the results of the latest vulnerability scan, things like that. Um, I kind of touched on this earlier, but there's no better way to learn than to post-mortem incidents. So, I kind of mentioned at the very beginning of the talk that, you know, DevOps was kind of amorphous when it came to like the culture side of things. There's also certain practices that are kind of hard to get a grip on, right? So, you know, I read a lot of blog posts about the just culture and blameless postmortems, and there's a 30 page guide from Etsy. And, you know, as a practitioner who's helping to implement these practices, but also I was a builder, right? So I had cards I had to work every day to get the infrastructure bill. Remember, we're a team of three. We don't have the resources to get in uh, Gene Kim and John Halspot to talk to us. So um, we, we didn't really know how to do postmortems, but the simplest thing to do is just to get started, right? So 
we just put a checklist item on our deploy checklist. If the deploy fails, send out a calendar invite for 30 minutes the next day. We just got in a room together, opened up a wiki page, and tried to type out what happened. And of course, it was a shambles the first time. And uh, you know, as we iterated on it, we got better. People kind of understood what to expect. People, there's no shame in like, oh, I screwed something up. I need to call a postmortem. So people started doing that, um, and we kind of got that built into our culture. So then, you know, out of those postmortems, we would take the things we learned, and then uh, folks would go back to their respective teams, generate cards that would go into the sprint work to kind of remediate the underlying uh, things that maybe led to the incident. So the last thing I'm going to talk about here is kind of experimentation. So we do this really cool thing called Innovation Day. And uh, Innovation Day is one day every two weeks where the application and ops teams don't do any sprint work. Instead, each person pursues a project of their choice. Um, so at the beginning of the day, there's a stand-up, and uh, everyone kind of goes around the room and talks about what they plan to work on that day. And if that gives the opportunity for people to find a pair partner if they're looking for a project or something. And then at the end of the day, we have a demo time where people can show what they learned during the day if they want. Um, and Innovation Day has really been valuable, and a ton of things have come out of it. Um, we've actually had features been built that, that got into the application. or So they were prototyped on Innovation Day. They were recognized as extremely valuable. They got turned into card work and became you know, official and worked through the normal sprint process. Um, we've also had time to kick the tires on lots of new things and explore viability of um, different container platforms. and. You know, developers have been experimenting with Lambda and kind of you know, learning new tricks and techniques. So it's been a really awesome thing for us. Um, I think that's the last slide. So um, thanks for letting me share that story with you all. And uh, I guess we have a few minutes. So that's the end.